So good morning, everybody, and welcome for this new seminar from the Instituto Astrofisica Andalucía in Granada, in Spain. And today we will have the talk by Frick Ruelef from the Center of Astrophysics in Harvard and, and in Smithsonian. And he will talk about studying magnetic fields, dynamics, and fundamental physics near a black hole with current and future millimeter BLBI instruments. So the uh, freak will be introduced uh, properly by, okay, thank you. Thank you very much, uh, René. I don't know if your cam should be on, but yeah. yes. All right, so it is really for me a great pleasure to have you here, Frank. Uh, so Frank is, uh, is visiting NASA during this week, and he's coming as uh, René mentioned, uh, he's coming from Harvard for Center of Astrophysics and Black Hole Initiative. and. Uh, and we have been working with Frank for a long time. He is uh, I, I, one of the most active members of the Evan Horizon Telescope, and he's also working very actively in developing the new rays, and in particular the next generation Evan Horizon Telescope. Uh, uh, he has been recognized uh, uh, I, I, with uh, one of the EHD awards, and in particular the Outstanding PhD award from EHD for his numerous and, and, and very important contributions uh, to the EHD so far. He finished uh, his PhD in the, at the end of 2020 in, uh, in uh, his PhD uh, in Radboud University. His advisor was uh, Heino Falke. And after that, he moved uh, to the CFA um, and Black Hole Initiative, as we mentioned uh, before. And currently, he is working many different aspects in the EHD and NGHD. He is one of the best experts we have for uh, BLBI data reduction, uh, modeling of BLBI data, generation of uh, BLBI data, and also uh, um, uh, he's actively participating not only in the Next Generation Event Horizon Telescope, but also in the Event Horizon Explorer, which is a space BLBI mission uh, to observe black holes, uh, to image black holes, to take uh, movies of black holes. And, uh, and uh, so we are really honored to, to have a uh, Frank here uh, with us today. So he's going to talk a little bit about everything. And uh, at the beginning of the talk, he will show some of the results. And you may have seen that actually yesterday we published and there were there was uh, some uh, uh, press releases in, in Spain, in the US, and in, in, in Germany, uh, basically all, all across the, the world, because we published the first circular polarization observations of, of, of black holes. Uh, of black holes in particular, circular polarization of M87. And uh, Frank also published an, uh, one of the extra paper uh, as leading author to, uh, with uh, some of the modeling of, uh, of the data. So he's going to talk about us uh, today about this. And, uh, and then in the second part of the end, ending part of the talk, he's going to present also the new projects from the HD. So uh, if people are interested in, in imaging and uh, taking uh, movies of black holes, so he's going to talk to tell us about what are the next step in the in the study of black holes with a millimeter BBI. So thank you very much, Frank, and uh, happy to have you here. Great, thank you very much for a very nice introduction. Uh, it's really great to to be here uh, and talk to you about these uh, these new each the uh, results that just came out yesterday. Um, first, uh, I'll just give a little bit of an introduction to EHT for. Uh, in case you're not very familiar with it. So the EHC is this millimeter VLBI array with stations all over the globe that we've used to make the first images of uh, the black hole shadows in M87 and Saturday Star that I'm sure you've all seen. Um, these two black holes are, um, uh, the images look pretty similar, but they're pretty different objects. M87 is a six and a half billion solar mass black hole uh, in a giant elliptical galaxy 55 million light years away. And Sede Star is our own uh, black hole, the supermassive black hole in the galactic center, which is only 4.2 million uh, um, solar masses. And an immediate consequence of this uh, mass difference, uh, which I'll come back to many times in this talk, is that the time scales associated with variations in these sources are very different. Um, because for a bigger black hole, it simply takes longer to uh, to orbit it, for the matter to orbit it. Um, so for M87, we see, see variations in the emission on a time scale of days. Uh, and Sebi star is much faster. Uh, it's variable on a time scale of minutes, and this gives us many headaches, um, but also some opportunities in the uh, HD analysis. 
Um, a bit about the, the 2017 observations. Um, here you can see some uh, uh, pictures. Uh, we see the El Pico, uh, Veleta, nearby here. Uh, I was here at the SMT uh, in Arizona, um, and we were still working on some data from these uh, observations and publishing about it. So this, this has been a very productive uh, uh, observing um, campaign. Um, so we're doing this together with the HD collaboration, um, which has more than 300 members in uh, 60 in institutes spread across the world. Here you can see some pictures from our uh, most recent collaboration meeting in Taichung in Taiwan. Um, this is the, the whole group. And here you may see uh, some familiar faces where we had a nice, uh, nice group dinner with some of the, the European uh, astronomers from the EHT. Um, so back to the science, we are looking at these two uh, main targets, M87 and Sege star. Um, if we look at um, um, lower frequencies than what the HD observes, that we see that these sources uh, are indeed quite different. For M87, we see this uh, very strong jet being launched. Um, and Sege star, we also see some uh, larger scale structure um, at lower frequencies, but we don't see it uh, just yet. Um, and we also know various properties of these two black holes to varying degrees, and that's sort of indicated with these uh, colors here. So for M87, especially before the EC observations, we didn't know the mass very well. There was a factor to uh, uncertainty. Um, we did have a good handle on the distance and the uh, inclination with respect to the black hole spin axis. Uh, because we see the direction in which the, the jet is being launched. Um, we do, still don't have a good handle on the spin of M87, and we have a bit of a handle on the uh, astrophysical model, again, from the jet observations. For Sagittarius A star, the situation is different in that we know the mass very precisely, and we know that from observations of stellar orbits in the galactic center. Uh, and uh, together with the distance measurements, this makes Sailor star uh, really an ideal black hole to, to, to do tests of general uh, relativity because the mass and distance together tells you exactly how large the black hole shadow should be on the sky. Um, we, we don't see a jet, so we don't really know the, the inclination of Sagittarius A star, uh, save for the spin and astrophysical model. And for Sagittarius A star, we have this additional complexity of the rapid variability on minute time scale and also interstellar scattering um, electrons between us and the galactic center that uh, that scatter uh, the radio waves, uh, which makes the, the image a bit more uh, blurry. Um, we, with the HD, we also observe uh, together with um, many instruments across the electromagnetic spectrum. So here you can see a very nice multi-wavelength view of M87 going from uh, the radio all the way to uh, gamma rays, observing M87 at the same time. So we really got this beautiful, complete picture of the uh, the black hole and the extended jet emission. Uh, I have a quite minor question. So yes. uh, may I ask how accurately we, um, do we uh, get the inclination or the information from the jet component? Um, uh, uncertainty of the so, so mostly say it is a 165 or 50 degrees, mm -hmm. but how do we can constraints the information? Um, it's a good question, and I'm not sure exactly what the what the uncertainty. Uh, so uh, is, observational yeah. uncertainty for the inclination. So uh, in EHD, we uh, simply use a uh, specific value of the inclination, mm -hmm. but I'm curious about the, uh, the uncertainty of the inclination angle coming from the. Yeah. 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 I, I don't know exactly what the uh, uncertainty feel is. is. Yeah, yeah. I feel like it's also the the this uh, this precision they get as uh, mm -hmm. you know yeah. in, in the nature paper. So it's yes, I would say with uncertainty four, five, ten degrees most. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I see. Right. Yeah. Thank you so much. Okay. Um. Yeah. Also for Sagittarius A star, we had this uh, major multi wavelength campaign. Uh, so here you can see as a function of time. Um. Whenever uh, these instruments uh, were observing Sagittarius star, the top row is when we have each observations on Sagittarius star. And what's interesting is that 
here um, on April 11, right before the start of the EC observation, there was a flare measured in uh, by Chandra in, in X rays. Um, so there was some uh, big uh, activity in the source there, and we are actually now starting up a new project within the EHT to see what we can see of that in the uh, in the EHT data, and if we want to try to see if we can get a signature of um, uh, these changes in the source. Um, so how do we uh, um, observe and make images with the EHT? We see we saw here the the waves, radio waves coming in. The recorded at each antenna individually. The data is written to hard disks, and these are then physically shipped to a correlator centers where per pair of antennas the data is correlated. And then there is a calibration process, and then in, in the end, we can make uh, an image of the source. Um, so, how does this imaging uh, work with FieldBI? Here we see the Earth rotating. Um, and we see the baselines connecting the telescope and they light up uh, whenever we had an observation of M87. In this plot, we see the length and orientations of these baselines plotted. Uh, and uh, this is what we call the UV plane. And on each point in this UV plane, uh, we measure a Fourier component of the source uh, image on the sky. So the short baselines, so the short Spacings between telescopes give us information about the larger scale structure of the source, and the longer baselines uh, determine the resolution of our instruments, and they give us the information on what the source looks like on the smallest scales. And combining that information, uh, if we have enough of these measurements, we can make uh, an image of the source. Um, but in order to do this, because we uh, we always have some gaps in this UV coverage, we don't have the full information about the image, we always has to have to make um, some assumptions on the source structure before we can reconstruct uh, an image. And I'll go back to that in, in a little bit. Um, but first, I want to talk a bit uh, about polarization. This is related to the, the results that came out yesterday. Um, so the uh, emission that we observe is synchrotron radiation. So this, this, is, this is coming from electrons gyrating around magnetic fields. Uh, and this emission is polarized um, in the direction perpendicular to this magnetic field. So if we make an image of our source in polarization, uh, as you see there, um, this uh, tells us about the configuration of the magnetic field. Um, but polarization is also affected by uh, light bending around the black hole uh, and also by uh, properties of the uh, accreting uh, plasma. Uh, so together, the polarization image uh, gives us a lot more information than the total intensity uh, alone. And we've seen in the EHT that this was very useful in constraining uh, the, our models um, that we uh, fit to the, the EHT data. So we, uh, we fit or we compare our EHT image to these uh, GRMST models of the plasma accreting onto the black hole. Um, and with the polarization, we could rule out many more than, than with the total intensity data um, alone. Um, what's also an interesting property of polarization is that it can prompt the black hole spin. And we can see an example of that here. Um, for a Schwarzschild black hole, also a non spinning black hole, we see um, a radial uh, pattern in the polarization. And then when we increase the spin, um, the uh, Magnetic fields are getting dragged around the black hole uh, in the uh, train breaking process. Um, and then, as a result of that, we get as a mutual uh, magnetic field, and then the polarization is perpendicular to that. So we get a more radial uh, polarization pattern for high spin black hole. Um, and the polarization is a, a probe of the accretion state. Uh, and by that, I mean the um, magnetic field flux training the event horizon. Uh, we can either have uh, a mad configuration, that means that there's a lot of magnetic flux during the event horizon, or when there is not so much magnetic flux, uh, we call that same. Um, and the uh, difference between them and polarization is that the mad model gives us these very uh, ordered polarization structures, and same models uh, would give us more turbulent polarization structures. Um, then, in addition to this linear polarization, there's also 
circular polarization. Circular polarization is generated also intrinsically in the synchrotron process, and it gives us uh, information about the strength and orientation of the magnetic field. Um, and you can see uh, example simulations here um, showing a GRMHD model um, of the black hole viewed at two different uh, inclinations, so from two different sides uh, of the uh, accretion disk. And we see that the sign of the circular polarization, uh, which can be left or right circular polarized or negative or positive, indicated with uh, red and blue colors. And we see that the sign flips uh, as you go to a uh, different orientation. We can also here in this cartoon, uh, we see uh, a typical helical magnetic field structure in the jet. Uh, and in these quadrants, the field is either coming in or out of the pain. And if we then look at here on these simulations, uh, they are viewed uh, with this viewing angle edge on. We see also these different quadrants coming back in the circular polarization emission. Um, but circular polarization, um, it's often difficult to interpret it uh, like that directly because it also uh, depends a lot on the plasma properties. It not, it's not just produced intrinsically, but also through a process called Faraday conversion. Uh, and this, this can happen through Faraday rotation. So this is the rotation of the polarization uh, as light is passing through a magnetized medium. Uh, or by twisting magnetic field uh, geometry. So um, in short, the polarization, uh, circular polarization also encodes a lot of information about the properties of the accretion plasma. Here we see uh, an example of some GRMSD models drawn from our GRMSD library uh, in circular polarization for a lot of uh, different parameters. Um, and the, the takeaway here is that you see a wide range of circular polarization structures um, and also a lot of sign flips of the circular polarization uh, within the same image. We can blur the, um, uh, the GRMC images to the EHD resolution to see what the EHD would approximately see when observing these models. Uh, and then we see that many of them are producing um, when we sort of average uh, over this more complicated structure, we see that many of them are producing simple structures that are uh, dipoles that have um, right circular polarization on one side and then left on the uh, other side. But the, the orientation of this dipole can, can vary quite a lot between models and samples. So it's, um, it's not often easy to interpret. Um, so what I've been doing in this project is try to um, uh, approximate the source structure in polarization using geometric modeling. And this is a different process than uh, the imaging um, that, that uh, I talk about, because imaging is using a many parameter model, uh, which are the, the pixel values of the image, um, with regularization constraints. And these are the assumptions you make on, for example, the smoothness of the image or the sparsity um, that you have to do to deal with this sparse uh, UV coverage or incomplete sampling. Um, but in the geometric model, we uh, impose the assumptions in the model itself. So we choose a geometric model that only depends on a few parameters, uh, but that can still represent the emission that we see with the EP very well. Um, and this has some uh, advantages. It will naturally give you uh, measurements with error bars of parameters that we are typically interested in. Um, for example, here the uh, a diameter of the ring or the thickness of the ring. Um, and it can provide constraints even if there is not sufficient coverage or signal to noise ratio to do uh, a full imaging uh, process. And this can help in uh, constraining the dynamics of CJ star, which is rapidly varying. Uh, so for CJ star, we have to rely on very short snippets of data and, and using uh, modeling, uh, we can get some constraints, even though we have very little data at each given uh, time uh, point. Uh, we can use it to uh, uh, get information from sparse array where not many stations are observing and also to get constraints on weak signals such as those in polarization. 
Uh, and it's also computationally very efficient. We can do everything analytically. So our favorite model to fit to the, to the EHC data is uh, what we call the, uh, the Emory model. And the Emory model is just uh, a simple uh, geometric model. Uh, it's just a ring that's represented by this delta function. And so this is representing a ring with, with a certain diameter. Um, and then along the ring, we decompose an angular profile into Fourier modes. And uh, these are weighted by these complex numbers, the beta. And by adding more and more of these Fourier modes, we can make a more and more complex structure along the ring. And you can see an example of it here, uh, where we have uh, the, the zero, one, and the two mode. The zero mode is just uh, a, flat, um, a flat flux here. The uh, m equals one, we can see uh, one uh, oscillation for m equals two, we can see two. And then uh, here on the uh, on this line, we can see the sum of them. And then it's also represented in this image. So you see with just these few components, we can also already get an image that looks quite a lot like the image of m seven uh, that you've seen, which is a bit rough in, uh, in this case. Fascinating question. So yes. uh, you provide the uh, uh, red and blue uh, color component of the stocks, right? Mm -hmm. we, 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 and is it sufficient to uh, to use uh, MG ring model to reproduce uh, these kind of uh, direction inverted feature? Yeah, yeah. So I'll actually talk about that ah, okay. in, in, in a little bit. Yeah. Um, so we've extended this M-ring model to uh, polarization, uh, and there it works the same as in total intensity with the difference that the image is now complex. So um, we have um, um, not only an intensity, but also a, a direction of the uh, polarization emission. Uh, and what's especially interesting here is this beta 2 mode, um, because this is uh, setting the twistiness of the uh, magnetic field um, pattern. So for beta two equals one, we have this radial uh, pattern. For beta two equals minus one, we get a, uh, an azimuthal pattern. And for the complex modes i and minus i, we get this uh, twisty pattern. So measuring this beta two mode will give us information about this magnetic field twistiness that, as I showed earlier, can be a probe of the uh, black hole spin. We also extended this to circular polarization. So there, the difference is now. Um, that the emission can be positive or negative. This is indicated with the, uh, the contours, blue and red contours here. Uh, and here you can see an example. In this case, it's just a, a dipole uh, with a zero net um, circular polarization. Here we uh, rotated the dipole. Um, as you can see here, it was minus 25 degrees, and we had a, a net circular polarization of 5%. So the red part is a bit brighter. Uh, and then here we have uh, the beta two modes and circular polarization uh, to make a more complex structure. So this is just an example of how you can build up um, uh, a Stokes-free structure. Sorry, but your uh, GRMG model provides a, like a outer a component is the red and the inner component is blue. So in this case, uh, yeah, I, I think uh, EHD a resolution with blue as this kind of inverted uh, inner and outer feature. But uh, do you, uh, your uh, model also follows this kind of uh, inverted uh, outer and inner feature? Yeah, so if, it, if you really have a structure that is has an outer positive and in a negative ring, that is more difficult to reconstruct with just uh -huh. this model. Um, but what you could do in that case is take two of these M rings and fit oh, I see. one with a smaller radius and one with the larger radius. Uh, I start to, to approximate the structure like that. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but I haven't tried it before. I've, uh -huh. I've only uh, used the single angry models so far. Yeah. Um, okay, so let, let's apply these methods to uh, to some EHD data. So here we see on the four days that EHD observed M87 in 2015, April 5, 6, 10, and 11, the average image uh, that was already published by the EHD in uh, linear polarization, where we see this beautiful uh, twisty uh, pattern. Um, and now we uh, fitted uh, our M-ring model in polarization to the same data sets. And then these are the results we got. So in the middle row, we see 
uh, the posterior maximum of our fits um, to the same data. And then the bottom row, we blurred these fits to the same resolution as these uh, images were blurred. So we can compare them more directly. Uh, and you can see already by eye that um, the structure that we get with the Emory model is, is very similar to what we get with the, with the imaging approach. So even though we're only using a few parameters, we can really approximate the structure in linear polarization uh, quite well. Now in circular polarization, uh, we need to uh, take a lot of care in uh, the data products that we're fitting because circular polarization is a very weak signal. It's a, a usually a percent level signal. Um, and we have to be very careful with our, our data calibration and, and data products. Um, so don't try to understand all the details of this if you don't work with uh, BOBI data uh, every day, but I'll, I'll try to go through it uh, a little bit. So each antenna of the EHD records in left and right the circular polarization. And then we correlate the data per pair of antennas. So then we can form these four uh, correlation products. We can do, uh, have left, left, right, right, left, right, or right, left. And the circular polarization information that we are after is primarily in the parallel hand visibilities, as we call them. So this left, left, and right, right. You see them written out here. Don't look at all the terms. Uh, just see that right, right depends on I plus V, so the total intensity plus the circular polarization. And left, left depends on I minus V. And using these uh, data products, we can um, form data products that are invariant to many of the uh, calibration uh, issues that we have in the EHT, such as those from the uh, atmosphere. And what we can do is take the ratio of these right right over left left, because then our atmospheric fluctuations cancel out, and we uh, are left with something that's written here that depends on the, the Stokes V uh, and only on the ratio of these uh, the, the D terms, these are the antenna gains um, that can be quite uncertain, but the uh, ratio of them is usually quite stable and we have a decent handle uh, on them. Uh, so that makes this right, right over left, left data product uh, a useful data product, although there is still some calibration uncertainty due to the gain ratio that we can know pretty well, but not perfect. Another thing we can do is use uh, closure quantities of these uh, parallel hands, and these will be fully independent of these uh, right and left gains. Um, but we pay a little price for that in that there is a bit less information in the closure quantities than in taking the, uh, the full uh, ratio of these correlation products. What are these closure quantities? Um, so these can be closure amplitudes and closure phases. I'll, I'll just show you closure phases here. It is the sum of the visibility phases, so the phase of this Fourier component um, measured across a closed triangle of baselines. And when you sum up the phases here, the um, uh, data corruptions at the individual stations, uh, they drop out. So here, for example, they can enter with the plus sign, but then on the other baseline to the same station, they enter with the minus sign and, uh, and they cancel out. So this is really, a very robust uh, data product that we can use to get information on our source structure. Um, if you measure a, a closure phase on, on a triangle that is deviating from either zero or 180 degrees, you know that you're looking at a source that has some uh, intrinsic structure. So it's not just a symmetric rock on the sky, but you, uh, you know that you're measuring some more complicated uh, structure. Um, that is the case for total intensity. And if we now look at circular polarization, we have to look at the differences in closure phases between these right, right, and left, left visibilities. And if we see non zero differences there, then we know that we have detected some circular polarization uh, structure. Here you can see some examples of that. Uh, I'm going to go through all the panels here. But if you look, for example, at this top left panel, I put in an M ring uh, that has some asymmetric structure in total intensity. So if you try it on this side and this side, so we have non-zero closure phases that also change as a function of time. Um, but the closure phase differences between left, left, and right, right 
are uh, completely consistent with zero. So we're not measuring uh, indeed any circular polarization here. Looking at this model, which has the same structure in total intensity, but I've added here a circular polarization component that is uh, also asymmetric, we see that uh, we start to see differences between these right right and left left closure phases. Um, here you can see that they are significantly non zero. So if you see something like this, you know, okay, I've measured some kind of complicated um, circular polarization structure. Um, even though from this you might not know exactly what it looks like, you, you know that it's uh, definitely uh, there. Um, and this is exactly what was the main result uh, that we published yesterday with uh, the EHT. So here you can see measurements uh, of these closure phases in the, the parallel hands um, on this triangle from uh, Alma in Chile to the SMT in Arizona to the LMT in Mexico. Uh, and we see here on all the observing days and uh, the frequency bands that the EC observes in, we see that the closure phase differences are significantly non-zero. So from this, we know that we have detected uh, some circular polarization structure on scales of the uh, of the event horizon in uh, M87. Um, and we, we were quite um, happy uh, seeing this because it was uh, really not a given. We're looking at a percent level signal, and you can see that here in this plot, uh, which shows the signal to noise ratio of the circular polarization uh, on our different baselines. Uh, that is indicated with the colors, and the gray points indicate the signal to noise ratio of our total intensity. So you can see there can really be two orders of magnitude differences here. So we're really looking at a, at a very weak signal, but we, we managed to tease out. Uh, a detection of the circular polarization structure. Can I ask one? Uh, yes. My question. So uh, there is a slight difference between the low band and the left band in left and right panel. And uh, is there any uh, possible um, reason for the uh, ultra different morphology uh, to the tiny direction? Um, or well, I, I think the... that this is probably uh -huh. consistent uh -huh. uh, within the error bars. I don't think. Ah, it, uh, these are very significantly uh, different. I, I think. Yeah. yeah, I'm curious about the, the, the slope of the, of the, of the, of the R and the L difference between L and L1 and I1. Yeah. Yeah, uh, we signal is uh, too small, so yeah. Yeah, uh, that would be interesting if you would see something like that, but yeah, I don't think we, we can uh, conclude that from, uh, from these observations yet. Um, so now that we have detected uh, the circular polarization structure, the next question becomes, can we actually make an image of the circular polarization structure? Uh, so to, that, to answer that question, we first look at some synthetic, uh, so simulated EHT data. So we took uh, a GRMHD model that you can see here in linear and uh, circular polarization. We simulated each the observations of this model with the same properties as the each the observations of MHC7 in 2017. And then we tried to reconstruct uh, these uh, structures with uh, a lot of different methods uh, developed by different people in the collaboration. Uh, and we can see here the results for the linear polarization. So all, all these, um, the columns here, show all kinds of different uh, imaging methods for the linear polarization. And on the far right is our uh, M-ring geometric modeling methods. Uh, so you see in linear polarization, all these different methods uh, agree with each other quite well, and also do uh, quite well at reconstructing the basic properties of the, uh, the ground truth model that we put in. If we now look at circular polarization, this uh, the pictures looks quite different. We see that there are more significant differences um, between the structures uh, reconstructed by the imaging methods. Um, and we also see that not all methods uh, do very well at reconstructing the, uh, the ground truth source structure. Um, the Emring model here we see uh, does uh, pretty well. We only allow a very simple structure here, a dipole structure. So it's what we call M equals one, uh, but it gets the, the overall orientation of this uh, structure that is in the model uh, quite well. And it also did well on uh, 
and some other synthetic data sets. What we see in this plot is the uh, uh, the absolute circular polarization fraction averaged over the, the whole image. Um, and then the stars are showing the prime truth values to our three different models. Uh, the panels that you see on top here correspond to data set number two. Uh, and then in the different colors, we see the recovery of the circular polarization fraction by our different methods. Um, and we see um, that most methods do pretty well when we have a relatively high circular polarization fraction of a uh, few percent here, three and a half percent. Um, but when we go to very low polarization fractions, we see that there's quite a lot of spread in the uh, the recovery from the different methods. Uh, but the every model, because it um, um, restricts the source structure to simple structures, uh, does quite well e even here to a sub percent signal in, uh, in circular polarization, um, where the, the imaging methods have uh, a bit more trouble. Um, so let's see what it looks like when we uh, apply this to real EFC data. So here we see the same methods um, applied to the EFC data on April 5 and April 6 at the two different observing bands. And here we see, like for the synthetic data, that the, um, um, the structures that are recovered are quite different between the methods, also between the different days and between uh, the different observing bands. Uh, so this is telling us that uh, even though we do see a circular polarization signal in the closure phases, um, we uh, we cannot make a robust image of the circular polarization structure yet. Um, and we see similar results here on the other days, April 10 and 11. What we could do from this analysis is establish an upper limit of this result uh, circular polarization fraction of 3.7%. Uh, uh, and this upper limit um, we saw is actually consistent with our GRMST simulations, and it's favoring uh, these math models, which had um, a coherent structure in linear polarization. And these math models were also favored by the linear polarization uh, observations of M87. Uh, and they're now also favored by the circular polarization observation. So this is a an independent way of verifying that uh, the math models are really uh, preferred here by the EHT data. We also see that the dominant uh, production mechanism for the circular polarization is uh, Faraday conversion. So what we see is not um, uh, circular polarization that was generated intrinsically in the synchrotron process, but it's been generated generated through all these plasma propagation um, effects. Um, going back to the images, uh, uh, what stands out is that the, uh, in contrast to the imaging methods, our geometric modeling methods are consistently uh, between all the days and between all the bands, also in the previous two days, sharing the same structure with more negative uh, circular polarization in the south, close to the peak of the total intensity. Um, so that, that's quite an, an interesting result um, that we'll look into. Uh, a bit deeper. So here we see our emery pits either to uh, these closure products or the right right of left left sensibilities. Um, and we see that no matter which data product we choose, we get approximately uh, the same structure for all the days. We can uh, now challenge the model a bit more. So here we only allow um, dipole structures, nothing more complicated than that. Uh, but now we go from m equals 1 to m equals 2. So in principle, we now allow uh, also quadruple structures, but we see that still uh, our data prefers to see um, this dipole offset between the south and the north region um, of the image. We can, uh, we can go even further to M equals three to allow even more complicated structures, but there we see it starts um, breaking down uh, a little bit. We start to see more variation between the, the structures. Um, except for April 11, the last day of EC observation, we see uh, we still get this dipole structure. And this was also the day that we had uh, the best coverage, the most data uh, for M87 with the EHT. So it, it really seems to uh, be preferred there. Um, so, what can we conclude from uh, this all? Um, we 
have detected circular polarization, but we could not reconstruct from a vast image. However, with uh, simple geometric models, we do get a clear indication of uh, a certain north-south asymmetry being favored by the data. Um, but we, we have to view that result with some caution, uh, given the difficulty that uh, the imaging method saw in reconstructing um, uh, consistent images. And because of the structural assumptions that we imposed, we, we saw before in the GRMSD simulations that I showed that a very complex uh, structure on small scales uh, can lead to this dipole structure in uh, on, at ESD resolution. Uh, so the underlying structure may be much more complex than just this, uh, this dipole. Um, but I'm pretty um, uh, positive in that um, with uh, a bit better coverage and sensitivity, uh, we will actually be able to uh, uh, to make those be images. I think we're pretty close to that, uh, given that uh, we've detected it uh, and we've seen some clear structural indications with, uh, with the modeling method. Um, so in the, the remainder of the talk, I want to talk about what is uh, next for the EHD. And I think one of the most exciting topics that the EHD will tackle in the coming years will be uh, dynamics uh, of the source. So we've now produced static images of this black hole, uh, but we want to see how things uh, change, how the plasma behaves uh, when, it, when it falls into the black hole. Um, for MIT-7, because it's uh, this bigger black hole that varies more slowly, we will need uh, really multi-week uh, movie campaigns uh, with a high dynamic range so that we can see not only this black hole shadow, but also the jet uh, being launched at the same time. Um, for SETI star, we will need uh, a very um, high time resolution. We will need a sub-hour time resolution to capture the, the rapid variability. Um, and both of these uh, can be accomplished by uh, extending the EHD with uh, more stations. So we can fill in the gaps uh, in this UV coverage, uh, and that will help us getting the dynamic range we need to image the M87 jet. And it will also help us getting more snapshot coverage so we can uh, re start to reconstruct movies of uh, the rapidly varying uh, SETI star emission. Um, and we are already working on this. We are expanding the EHD. So in the, the red sites here are the ones that observed in 2017. The three yellow sites here are uh, have already uh, participated in uh, later EHD observations uh, and there are also concrete plans to build an additional telescope in uh, Namibia. And you can see here in this plot uh, the black points showing the UV coverage in 2017 and the colored points are all the new baselines we get with these four additional stations. So you can see we are already filling uh, a lot of these gaps. Um, and to uh, answer the question, what can we um, see when we have these additional stations? We have to generate uh, synthetic data. Uh, and this was a large part of my uh, PhD, was developing such a synthetic data generation pipeline where we put in a lot of information uh, about the instruments uh, itself, um, but also we put in an atmospheric model um, so that uh, you, you can put in some weather uh, parameters, some weather conditions. Uh, and calculate the effect on the, on the measurements. Uh, and what we also put in are pointing offsets uh, of the antennas, because they're uh, not always pointed directly at the source, but they will be uh, offset and bobbing around uh, a little bit. Uh, so that's also an effect we have to, uh, an effect we have to take into account. Um, in addition to that, uh, um, you also need to specify the telescope location and an observation schedule. Uh, and then we can generate this EHD data as it would come out of our correlator. Uh, and then we pass this through an actual EHD calibration pipeline to get uh, a data set uh, very similar to the one that we would analyze um, with, uh, with the actual EHD. Um, and you can see here, uh, we applied this synthetic data generation pipeline on this model of m 7 and here with the 2017 array, we see a similar ring structure that we have uh, indeed observed. And then we, when we add the four extra stations, we see that the, the image uh, was sharp enough, and we can see some first hints 
of this uh, extended jet structure uh, of Enrique 7 that we uh, that we want to see. We want to see this jet being enlarged from the uh, from the black hole. Um, also, this will help a lot uh, with uh, imaging uh, Sagittarius star and making movies of Sagittarius star. Uh, so here's an analysis done by uh, Noemi Labella, who looked at the influence of uh, adding stations in uh, Africa, the African continent, to the EHD. Uh, so these are the AMT in Namibia, but also a station on the uh, Canary Islands. And uh, here we see um, a plot of the UV filling factor. So that is a measure of how much of this UV plane is filled with baselines. And we see that when we add these two African stations, we get uh, a lot of uh, extra filling factor uh, in this eastern part uh, of the array. Uh, so that will allow us to observe Sedisar and much longer with much better coverage, which will help uh, reconstructing movies. Um, and then we also showed here that uh, we put in uh, a model of a hotspot orbiting uh, the black hole uh, with the, with this extended EHT array with uh, even image, something like that. Um, but we want to go much further than this. Uh, so we are now developing the next generation event horizon telescope, which uh, will be uh, a huge extension of the EHT with uh, about 10 new sites added. Edit. Um, we will have simultaneous observations at 86 to 30 and 345 gigahertz, uh, a five-fold increase of the data recording rate, um, and uh, extended observing mode. So right now with the EHT, we observe only two weeks per year, so it's hard to do this long-term monitoring of the M87 jet, uh, but with the NG EHT, we'll be uh, able to observe uh, much more often. Um, and you can see here, the, the very dense UV coverage uh, that this uh, extension will lead to. Um, so to answer the question, what can we see with this extended uh, EHD, the next generation EHD, um, I'm now running the NGEHD analysis challenges. And what we do here is uh, we start from some ground fruit source model, we simulate NGEHD observations, uh, and then we publish those simulated observations on uh, a website, challenge.phd.org, where people can download them and analyze them, uh, and, the, and then we compare the results uh, to each other. And you can see uh, an example here of a submission by the team here at uh, IAA of the uh, of the M87 jet. Um, so we're doing this to help develop uh, science cases for the NGHD, uh, but also to identify strengths and weaknesses of different uh, analysis algorithms. And we've seen that it already has led to um, development of these algorithms. People are using these data sets to uh, make improvements on their uh, analysis methods. And it's really a broad community project. We have experts on the theoretical modeling, on the data analysis, um, but we also found that it's useful for people who are just getting started uh, on VLBR to work with these uh, synthetic data sets and uh, reconstruct these uh, beautiful NGEHD images. So if you want to get started with uh, VLBR analysis, this would be a, a good place to do that. Um, I'll just show uh, a few highlights of our challenge results. Here we uh, simulated a, a movie of M87 and weekly NGEHD observations of this movie for uh, five months. Um, and here you can see uh, as a function of time for different uh, methods, um, what they reconstructed. I just will, I will just highlight uh, this one here, which fits very well, which is the result uh, Bayesian imaging algorithm. And you can see here, uh, you get these beautiful reconstructions of the uh, M87 black hole shadow and uh, emission even far out into the uh, jet. And these are large scale images. And so these are really very funny uh, dynamic rates. Yes. Yeah, I, sorry, sorry for so for many questions. But mm -hmm. uh, it's quite interesting because five months observation uh, uh, requires uh, uh, expected observation in uh, summer time. And uh, um, typically, in my view, the summer time provides a uh, large opacity and uh, and which provides a uh, little noisy uh, of the uh, image yeah. construction. But uh, this image is quite beautiful, and uh, there's no 
frame to frame difference between the uh, the early time and the summer time reconstruction. Right. So yeah, right. So is it coming from the dynamical reconstruction advantage or uh, simply coming from from the uh, greater UV coverage of the energies? Um. Yeah. So a, a lot is just from the the uh, the extra UV coverage that you get. Um. I'm not sure if we actually included the the varying weather parameters oh, across time oh, here or not. I, I would have to go back to see if we actually uh, did that. Yeah, but um, if, if the weather condition are correctly yeah. included, it is quite beautiful. Yeah, yeah. 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 There, there are at least the, the, the weather conditions uh, are at least there the correct ones for April. Um, I have to check if I actually did vary them. Mm -hmm. Uh, across different uh, months, uh, but yes, with with NEC coverage, you can really. Yeah. Um, this this was all generated with the Simba pipeline, so it, it oh. really had all these uh, observation and calibration effects included. Um, so yeah, I was also quite pleasantly surprised with some of these reconstructions. Mm -hmm. They were they were really good. Yeah. Um, we also included models for Sagittarius A star. So here we uh, can see a hotspot that is forming and then uh, shearing out as it orbits. Um, so here it makes a full orbit within just one hour. Um, and we again did this, uh, the same thing with the uh, simulations of the NGC observations. Uh, and here on the right, you can see a comparison. Um, this was done by uh, Antonio um, with HD 2022 coverage and uh, NGHT coverage. And we see with HD 2022, we can see this uh, emission ring in the reconstruction, but we don't really see the, the orbiting hotspot. But with NGHT coverage, we do see this hotspot being formed uh, and sharing out within within just uh, one hour, thanks to the, uh, the additional UV coverage here. We also added in polarization. So here is just an example um, by uh, Justin Vega, who was my uh, undergraduate intern at, uh, at the CFA. Uh, who did some polarization reconstructions, and you can see you can recover the polarization structures here uh, up to far out in the jet as well. Uh, and we're now running a, a challenge. I won't go into much detail uh, about this, uh, but here we want to focus more on uh, parameter extraction rather than just uh, imaging. So if, you, if you're interested, uh, this is something you can still uh, participate in. Uh, and in parallel to this, we are running the NGEHD forecasting tournament. And this is uh, a social science experiment. It will be the first kind of its kind in astrophysics. Uh, and this is open for everyone to uh, to participate in uh, and hear people answer quantitative questions about the NGEHD, what it will look like, what it will be able to measure, and what, what people predict for the NGEHD to measure. Uh, and then people talk about this in small groups. Uh, and then we run the same uh, survey again, and we see how people's answers have changed uh, as a result of the discussions. Uh, and we can do multiple rounds of this so that we sort of track the group thinking on several of these uh, questions about the NGHD and the science that it will do. Um, and that will be helpful in identifying unresolved ambiguities that sort of live within people's minds uh, in the collaboration and can uh, hopefully uh, in the end lead to a more focused uh, uh, research effort. Um, and this is now also uh, running. Um, so everything has been posted on the NGEHD Slack. And if you are not, don't have access and are interested in participating, please let me know and uh, um, I can uh, send you the, the link. Now, after this, NGEHD will be be done imaging black holes? I think the answer is no, because there's still a lot to do um, in uh, space. So after the NGHT, we will be done on uh, the Earth, because the, uh, we are really limited by the uh, limited size of the Earth and the uh, atmosphere, which make observing at high frequencies very difficult. Um, but we can uh, make extensions uh, into space. So in space, uh, observing space satellites, you can bring uh, much longer baselines and observe at higher frequencies because there's no uh, atmosphere. 
And there is really unique and exciting science that is uh, only accessible with uh, a space array and not from the ground. Um, so I've been involved in the development of two of these space field BI array concepts. Uh, one is this uh, event horizon imager, which is just two or three satellites in circular orbits at slightly different radii. Uh, so you can see here as they orbit the Earth, they slightly drift apart. Uh, and as a result, in the UV plane, you get this dense uh, spiral structure. So we measure basically all the Fourier component of the image uh, up to a resolution of uh, down to 3.5 micro arc seconds. To give you a comparison, the current PhD resolution is about 23 uh, micro arc seconds. So that's really a, a huge, huge resolution boost. Uh, and you can see here that uh, with such a configuration, you can make really uh, very sharp, beautiful images of the of the black hole. Uh, we do see that the, uh, this concept is limited by the signal to noise ratio. So we uh, ideally want big dishes. Uh, this would are quite difficult to do uh, in space to launch a big dish that is can observe at these high frequency. Um, so maybe we have to do something like this, where we have an array of, of small dishes together, um, and then you can make these these really sharp images uh, where you can see this uh, this thin uh, photon ring that is encoding uh, a lot of information uh, about the black hole spin uh, and can be used to test general relativity. And here you can see movie reconstruction with this concept of M87, uh, the GRMHD model. And you can see here the, uh, the GRMHD input model and the reconstruction are almost indistinguishable from uh, each other. So this is a... Uh, would really give a, a huge um, boost in imaging. But it's difficult to do this. Uh, technically, there's some technologies needed that are uh, not fully developed yet for space applications. So there will have to be some technology demonstrations, uh, like very small missions in space before something like this uh, could launch. Uh, but it's, uh, it's a very promising, uh, exciting concept. Now, there's another uh, space field BI concept that is called the Event Horizon Explorer. Uh, and this will be just a single satellite extension of the uh, NGEHD. So it will observe together with the ground uh, NGEHD uh, stations. Um, and the aim here is to measure this, uh, this thin photon ring that we call the N equals one photon ring. This is where light has made a full U-turn around the black hole and it's lensed by the black hole in, into this very narrow ring. Mm -hmm. If we can measure that, we can measure the spin of the black hole accurately um, and do a much more precise tests of uh, general relativity. Um, and you can measure this when you go to uh, long baselines uh, around the geosynchronous uh, orbits, um, because then all the, uh, the larger scale structure is uh, washed out. Um, but uh, you do see this uh, uh, typical ringing that is caused by this thin photon ring. And if you can measure this pattern, you can measure um, its properties. Um, and this is um, currently envisioned to be a NASA mission, a medium explorers mission with a budget of around uh, $300 million uh, with a, a three and a half meter uh, dish in a, a geosynchronous orbit. Uh, and it will observe at the same frequencies as the uh, NGEHD um, and can, uh, as I mentioned, give us measurements of these, this thin uh, photon ring. And this is a collaboration uh, with mostly US institutions at the moment, but it's uh, still open to, uh, to other international partners uh, as well. Um, so that brings me to the end. Um, so I think. We have an exciting future ahead for movie to real AI and uh, black hole science. And uh, the EHD images are uh, certainly not the end, but there's the, uh, the beginning of many more uh, developments. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, that was very, 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 very comprehensive. You're talking many, many different aspects right? from imaging to movies to space to AI. Wonderful. So, uh, questions or, or comments? Yeah, so I Yeah, so very nice talk, really, really, really nice. And you, you were showing some like uh, 
testing, right, of like this five month period where you would observe and seven every mm -hmm. or weekly or something like that. Um, so how would you do that? Like, how would you coordinate like all of these telescopes? Yeah. Turn on into field eye modes every week. Like, is this something that have been talked about? Yeah, so that's a yeah. good question. So what I simulated here is, uh, is a bit, I think, a bit optimistic because I really simulated the full EHT plus NGEC array observing every week. Um, um, but um, with this, the NGEC will build many new stations. Um, so these will be really be dedicated to this project. Um, and we may not need the full array at every time um, to still be able to to image the solid and the jet. Okay. Uh, and we, for example, the EC now uses um, ALMA, which is a very, very sensitive uh, station. Uh, but also if we use other sensitive stations like the, the LMT in Mexico or the, uh, the NOEMA array in France, we can use those as, as anchors and still get very good uh, image quality. Yeah. What what is the uh, Africa millimeter telescope um, scheduled for uh, operating uh, construction and so on? Um, I'm not sure exactly, but uh, there's been a lot of developments in the funding, so there's a lot of funding for it now. Uh, so I would say within a few years, yeah. in principle, it uh, should be possible. But uh, I'm not sure. Like I'm not very involved in the, in it, so uh, not the exact timeline. And, and the, the idea with the NDHC is not to rely that much in, in ALMA as well, right? It's like, right. Uh, yeah. 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 So you can trigger observations without uh, having to go through the ALMA proposal system. Exactly. And so, on, right? yeah. Yeah. so we have dedicated NDHC stations that, that we can just use. Greg, in the, in the sequence polarization observations of MT7, 14, 17, the, the paper just came out, I guess, the, 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 there were some indications of a, a change in the ratio between uh, the two sequence polarization over time. Uh, did you model that? Uh, or did you try to model? Did you, do you have enough signal to see any possible variability in sequence polarization in your modeling of the data? Um, no, I, I haven't really uh, looked at that. Well, I done the modeling for different days uh, but i think the, the uncertainties there are still pretty large to mm -hmm. say anything about like anything the very good thing, yeah i think the, the dark hole structure is already a bit uncertain mm -hmm. um so i think for variability of circuit polarization we really need to get, get better data mm -hmm. yeah uh, at the beginning of the talk you, you showed some quantities for both the mt7 and MT that have been answered and you well know previously, but the PhD started answering some of these questions and many of these are still not answered. Mm -hmm. uh, at what part of the, the new uh, development in arrays and also pipelines can we expect uh, to answer some of these questions like NGSP in the phase one or do we need space field BI to answer a particular question? Uh, um. So I think with NGEC, we will be able to answer some question about, for example, the jet launching of MIT-7. We should be able to see that very nicely. We should be able to make movies of, of Sergei Star. Um, and that will help constrain plasma models there as well. Where we really need space is the, the high precision measurements of fundamental parameters, uh, like the black hole spin, for example. We, we could get a handle on that with NGEC, for example, from, from the polarization pattern and the variability. Uh, but to really make very high precision measurements uh, of black hole spin from the photon ring, that, that's something we really need to go to space for. And we also expect looking at other targets other than MV7 and SAJ because. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Yeah. So for the, the NGEC, I think it's planning to um, look at. A huge sample of targets, and I think at least of the order ten of those should be uh, imageable. Uh, we, we should be able to see a black hole shadow at uh, three forty five gigahertz or so, um, or at least measure measure its properties. Yeah. I want to know because the EHT has very long data, so must have very high resolution. And does it mean that we only can observe very strong and bright thoughts and we can't observe the Um, 
Well, we have um, so the 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 weaker source yeah. that we can observe is determined by the size of the dishes, and we have, for example, uh, Alma in there, so we can have quite uh, sensitive observations. So we're we're not very um, strongly limited by uh, by sensitivity at the moment with the HD. Like the the stronger limits is on the because of the sparsity of the um, so the, the number of stations we have that that's the most important bottleneck. So is the uh, EHD now only observing very strong sources like MA AK four? Oh, sorry, MA AK seven and the signature three. Yeah. So the the reasons that we observe those sources is not um, that they are particularly very strong sources. Um, but it's because they have the largest angular shadow um, on the sky. And so those are the sources where we can actually image the full vehicle shadow. Oh, I see. Yeah. Like, how do you try to hydrate modeling and imaging like it's any uh, do you think that if we go to 345 gigahertz uh, for any seven, would it, would it be possible to constrain in one ring? With EHD observations, um, it might be. It, it it could be it could be tricky, um, because it's um, yeah, it's a really high resolution signature. Um, but um, for example, Daniel Palombo has done this work for uh, polarization, showing that uh, on NGEC baselines, you could see the signature of the polarization pattern that flips between the n equals zero and the n equals one uh, emission. And that is something you could uh, just see uh, in the visibility uh, domain. You will see a flip of this, uh, uh, this beta 2 uh, observable. Um, but to make an actual image of the, of the uh, let's think we could do it uh, mm -hmm. in the 345. But with some other link, we can maybe get some information. Um. I'm not sure I understood everything about the closure phase, <laughs> but like you seem like that, or what you showed is only like uh, one of the triangle, let's say, like three station, and you calculate the closure phase from there. And then you, but is it from only this these three stations, or you tried it from other? Yeah, we, we looked at all all the triangles, uh -huh. but it was only this triangle where we saw this clear difference. Okay. Uh, between okay. the right right and the left. Okay. The other ones, like I guess the I don't know the the signal is not good enough, or like what? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so like only those are really good. But... Yeah, exactly. That's where we saw this clear, uh, clear difference. One quick question: Is Simba available online? And um, is there a tutorial for? Um, yeah, it is, it is online. Uh, you, you can download it. Um, the there is some tutorial for from a very long time ago, but I can pull it up. Um, it, it has a little bit of learning curve because there are many parameters that, that need to be uh, set. But in principle, it's it's all available uh, if you want to use it. I want to know as for the space where the only mentioned about three and uh, new telescopes in space and the gap of each telescope is very slight. Mm -hmm. Why we don't put a larger gap? Um so the um, so the this movie again. Yeah. yeah. So you see. With, with a slight gap already after uh, a while, we get a very large distance between some of these telescopes. So even if you have a small gap, yeah. the resolution is really determined by the, the size of the orbit itself and not by the, yeah. uh, the gap. Um, we, we, what you can do is play around with the size of this gap, uh, and it will mainly set the time scale it takes to go from the shortest to the longest baseline. So if you put them very close together, you get a very dense uh, spiral structure. Yeah. If you put them further apart, you will get a less dense uh, spiral structure, which uh, you know maybe only has a few 
orbits here and then it reaches the longest beta one. Uh, and that, that can be helpful uh, for some sources where you want to image variability, for example, where you want to more quickly fill the UV plane, even though it's uh, less dense. Yeah, this um, is maybe I see. You can result in the variability. Yeah, maybe here you didn't put the ground ground space baseline. So right, this is pure pure. Space. If you add the ground space baseline, you will get a, it's, it's sometimes even much better. Yeah, yeah, that could help them. Yeah. Well, this is observing at a uh, very high frequency, so that is difficult to do oh, yeah, from the ground for uh, for a long time. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, I, I think the principle something like this we should definitely do. Uh, like some some kind of hybrid where we have a yeah. high frequency mode for a space yeah. phase and then at the two thirty yeah. three or three forty five receiver to do observations with the ground. Yeah. And you can put the satellites farther apart, but then you have the issue also of the communications nowadays. We are trying to have uh, optical communications yeah. for you know high signal to noise uh, data for light bandwidth. You put the file away, then the communication make uh, it's going to be a, a lot less reliable. Mm -hmm. And then also, if you put the file away, the the coverage of the, uh, the feeling of the UV coverage is going to be a lot slower. So, for instance, for side A, we wouldn't be able to get you know minute scale movies uh, like on the upper edge at scenes and things like that. But there's a lot of very, very interesting science on there. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Isn't there like a Problem to send the data because right now you have to ship the data. <laughs> right. right. Yes. <laughs> yes. Yeah. No, we're not going there with, with our kids <laughs> to get the yeah, We can send the students. Collect the data. Bring that. Yeah, no, so that, that, that is indeed an issue. So you would either need a very high bandwidth uh, data dumping. Uh, what we looked at with this coverage, uh, this. Um, configuration is to, to do the correlation actually on boards. So we would have right. the uh, data uh, sharing between the, the satellite, then do the correlation on board before sending it down. Um, yeah. Okay, so thanks a lot, uh, Frank. <laughs>